anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric in, uh, in Britain. Enoch Powell in the 1960s talked about rivers of blood uh, because there were too many immigrants who brought these in. Um, these rivers of, bl of blood did not happen in, in Britain, of course. of course. Now, the question, of course, is why is the fire rate thriving in Europe? Uh, well, the typical left liberal answer is that the economy is not doing well. And was, although you cannot explain everything on the basis of the economy, it goes a long way. Uh, there is one problem with the way the EU is run. Uh, this problem is austerity. That is, austerity programs, if you read Paul Krugman in the New York Times, he bashes Europe and uh, especially Germany every time he gets the chance. Because when you impose austerity on fragile societies, uh, you, co you create poverty, and poverty leads to uh, belief in demagogues. What is interesting that is, though is that there's a clear divide in Europe. Some countries do not have a strong far-right movement. Greece has a far-right movement, but it's less strong than the left. In Portugal and Spain, the far right is not doing well. Uh, the far left is doing well in Spain with Podemos. Uh, why? Uh, and in Italy, they, uh, the far right is actually weaker now than it was 10 years ago. And uh, Spain and Portugal and Greece, up to a certain point, prefer left wing protest movements precisely because they have a history of totalitarian regimes in the past. Uh, Franco in Spain, Salazar in Portugal, and of course Mussolini in Italy. And uh, far, the far right was in power at the time of the colonels in Greece. So uh, they have an experience with the far right, and that is one factor why the far right is not thriving in, in these countries. And in Germany, of course, there's a terrible experience with the far right, and uh, today the, the far right in Germany is contained. It's uh, at most 10, 10, 20, 12 percent. These are not close to power. Maybe because of the history of Germany. Uh, so economic policy in Europe plays a part. Uh, the recent so-called refugee crisis also plays a part, but the fire rate uh, uh, rose before the refugee crisis. And most of the immigrants who are in Europe today are people who uh, were asked to go to Europe. In Germany, they call them Gastarbeiter, guest workers. When in the 60s and 70s, when the economy was doing well, uh, there was a need for labor, uh, and people from former colonies in the case of France came to France, and people from Turkey went to Germany. So a lot of the immigrants are actually the second generation so-called immigrants uh, who came at the time when there was a need for labor. <coughs> Now, the question about the relationship between the far right in Europe and possible far right in the US, of course, is uh, Donald Trump. Uh, with uh, many newspapers asking whether uh, Donald Trump, Trump is like uh, uh, Marie Le Pen, the, the leader of the National Front of Europe. But I think he's closer to Jean Marie Le Pen. He comes across as somebody who is anti immigrant, uh, anti Mexican, anti Muslim, anti women, anti almost everyone, except maybe white males. Uh, but he doesn't come across as somebody who really wants to achieve power, become the, the president. He wants uh, a bully pulpit without being the president, I think. Uh, so the, the far right as a movement, as a political movement, so far, does not seem to be as organized in the United States as uh, in Europe. Although you could argue that the Tea Parties, in some cases, have similarities with European far right movements. Okay. Uh, but the Tea Parties have a complex relationship with power. They're very powerful at the time of the primaries, not so powerful nationally in the Republican Party. Uh, so links, because of course, anti-immigrant rhetoric, uh, xenophobia uh, are common. Anti-Semitism in the United States is uh, very rare, although there are a few cases, a few statements, but I don't think Trump has uh, made anti-Semitic statements. Although there's a, 
and there's a, a, an anti-Semitic subconscious in, uh, in Europe. Uh, now what is worrying is that in some countries in Northern Europe, uh, social democratic countries, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, there are strong far-right movements. Uh, in, in Finland, I think the, the party calls it like the real things, uh, like the real Americans uh, used by some politicians in, uh, in the uh, United States. And this is a novel development, because uh, in Scandinavia, uh, everyone was, in American terms, left-wing or liberal. Uh, and the far right in these countries uh, is a reaction to what they perceive is uh, too high a number of refugees or immigrants. So uh, the, the, the crisis uh, around refugees feeds uh, a move to, towards the, the right. And what is significant is that in all of these countries, the far right has a lot of support among workers. Uh, in France, the National Front is the number one uh, party among workers. It, so it is an elite movement, but supported mostly by workers. One reason for the development of these parties is also that the so-called elites, I think the word elite is problematic because it, elites etymologically means you're elected and you're the best. But the elites or the leaders have in large part failed ordinary citizens at the level of Europe. Wrong economic policies, corruption among uh, governing parties. Uh, so, and the opposition from the left uh, in many cases was discredited because uh, it did not change anything, it aligned with uh, right wing policies. So, very often the far right is the only political alternative. And although we, we know, you, you're talking about Andrew so, uh, although we know uh, that all of these movements are equally corrupt, nepotic, uh, very problematic, they lie as much as other parties, they're not different sorts of politicians. For example, the National Front tries to project the image of, we're not anti-Semitic anymore. They try to appeal to some organizations in Israel. But Marine Le Pen was caught dancing with a guy who is a former Nazi in Vienna. So the anti-Semitism is there. But there are equal opportunity demonizers and, and demagogues, so they can be anti-Semitic, anti-Arab, uh, anti-any kind of immigrant. This is unfortunately fostered by uh, the neoliberals who are in favor of austerity. And when uh, people are either unemployed or they're afraid of losing their jobs or losing their benefits, then they try the only political alternative, which unfortunately, in many places in Europe, uh, mostly in Northern Europe, including in France, uh, is uh, the far right. So uh, the question is, what can be done uh, in order to stem the rise of the far right, which is very frightening in some cases, and I think France is uh, one of the most worrying cases, because in Sweden uh, or Germany, in the near future, the far right is not going to come to power. Uh, I think the safety net, uh, which was, is part of the European welfare state, state, which is slowly being dismantled, should be saved, rescued. Uh, and all programs in the safety net should not uh, based on race or ethnicity, but economic need. Uh, the, an approach which would uh, make distinctions between groups on the basis of their origins, uh, their uh, religious beliefs and so on, or social programs is going to be wrong. Uh, and of course, what we need is uh, coalitions of all the parties that are opposed to the slight to the extreme far right which is something which is extremely difficult to do in some countries. Uh, each party or each uh, ideological movement wants to remain pure and finds it very difficult to form an alliance. And, but we come to a pass where uh, we have to fight against unemployment, the end of the safety net, uh, and include all those who are against the uh, 
the uh, anti, the xenophobic, uh, the demagoguery of the far right politicians. So that includes, for example, working with the majority of Muslims who are in favour of democracy in our countries, working uh, with people of any kind of background uh, in the name of a democratic ideal. But this is really a hard task. And uh, I think our leaders have to uh, interrogate their views about the economy because they, they are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Richard. Well, so much to say here, so little time. Uh, first of all, let's talk about what right and left means because uh, it might be a bit confusing, especially with respect to European politics. You know, the so-called parties of the right, it's amazing how the Nazis are lumped into there. Uh, the Nazi party stands for the German Socialist Workers Party. Socialism is a thing of the left. Uh, the Nazis only look right-wing if you're starting off as a Marxist, because they're to your right. The more honest way of looking at the political spectrum is how the parties view the role of government, or in European terms, of the state. So do they imagine a society in which the individual is free to make the widest possible choices, or do they imagine a society in which the government or the state makes all of those choices for you, or do they imagine something in between? So the society in which the state makes all the choices is the society of the left, right? The Soviet Union is one example. Uh, Western Europe, unfortunately, is kind of another. Uh, and then you can go all the way down to which the individual has total autonomy, which is in a sort of imaginary society, uh, anarchy, if you will, if you're a fan of the philosopher Robert Nozick. And most parties fit somewhere in between. And to make things even more confusing, parties move over time as the voters change and as the situations change. But all parties are sort of on this continuum between total dominance uh, run by the central power and total freedom, which is essentially anarchy. Now, along those, that continuum, there are four possible choices. And this is why I'm talking about right and left. Let's start in America, because that's where we all hear right now. There are basically three and a half political parties in the United States. Now, there's the political party that believes in what we could call economic freedom, because it's so confusing to talk about economic conservatism or, so, or economic liberalism, because they mean literally opposite things between Europe and the United States. But economic freedom, people who like deregulation, privatization, individual autonomy, that's what we mean by economic freedom for the purposes of this discussion, right? So there's the party that likes that, uh, plus social conservatism, which is what they also call traditional values, which is you know, sort of anti-gay marriage, anti-abortion, you know the drill. That's one option. The second option is economic uh, freedom and social liberalism, and that's to say, the economy is free, you're able to start whatever business you need, you don't need licenses and that kind of thing. But on, this, on the other hand, you're also in favor of uh, abortion, gay marriage, let people live as they want. You could call that position libertarian, right? That's the one quarter party, uh, the smallest of the small. Then there's the those who are economically unfree and socially liberal. That's essentially the modern Democratic Party. So they're opposed to the free market in the broadest sense, although not in every case but they are social liberals who believe that people in their private lives should be able to live as they like. Uh, and then the, the third alternative, a major alternative, is those who are economically unfree and socially unfree. Uh, and that's essentially the Donald Trump party who believes that the government should determine what goods are made where. Uh, if uh, cheap goods come in from Mexico or China or something, uh, he is personally going to punish them and stop uh, the free movement of goods across borders. Uh, on the other hand, he doesn't like the free movement of people across borders, so that's sort of economic unfreedom. But on the other hand, he is uh, anti-abortion, and, and these days, anti-gay marriage. So that puts him in a third philosophical camp. Now, when you've got three and a half philosophies and two parties, you can see how this gets confusing in America, right? The parties all keep changing, right? So in the 1920s, for example, the Democratic Party was for individualism, free trade, suspicious of labor unions. Now it's not, right? The Republican Party in the 1920s, uh, a fan of big government, a fan of labor unions, a fan of protectionism, 
and so on. You see how this goes. And every, all of these things are constantly in motion as two parties try to deal with three and a half political factions and assemble a winning coalition. So talking about it in a coherent, this is the right, this is the left way, is just basically impossible, right? And in fact, throughout our lives, we all have different tendencies, right? So what's the old joke? Uh, no man with a 15-year-old daughter is libertarian, right? <laughs> well, okay, but you know, when you're 15 years old, libertarianism sounds pretty good, right? So we change political philosophies as we move through life, too, and so do countries at different points, right? And at this point in our history, we're at a pretty fearful time, both economically and because of uh, foreign threats and so on. So you see more movements in favor of the security state. Um, more people are, the recent poll that came out today, they're, they're unhappy that Apple is denying access to the, the iPhones of the San Bernardino killers. 72% of Americans say that's an outrage. But you know, if you took that same poll a few years earlier, I think the results would have been probably the opposite. We'd all be more in favor of the privacy of individual phones. So these, these things change over time. That's the American political context, as confusing it, as it is. And one last thing, the reason why it's almost impossible to draw parallels between American politics and European politics is because they divide at about 1600, right? We don't recognize it because we all swim in it, but our politics are essentially modified Elizabethanism, right? Our politics begin and you can read this in the Federalist Papers and the various uh, early American thinkers, deeply influenced by the world of Queen Elizabeth that they left behind. Classic example, I'll tell you a little obscure story to illustrate this point, and then I'll move on to European politics. I don't know if anyone remembers uh, the Lord Protector, Thomas Cromwell, the English Civil War, 1640s, 1650s, uh, sends a note to the colony of Virginia as the Lord Protector. He is, at this point, killed the king illegally, say the supporters of the king, and he says that they are to stop praying in the old-fashioned way, and they are to disband their house of worship and follow the Puritan method of prayer. The royal governor and the House of Burgesses, which is the state legislature of the colony of Virginia at the time, send back a letter. We think it's terrible that you've killed our king. When we find you on our soil, we will try you for murder. Thanks for warning us that you uh, intend to try to violate our rights as English people. You will discover that if you try to uh, impose your will upon us, that we will fight back. Cromwell writes the second letter. Remember, this is 100 years, 120 years before the US Revolution. And says, I will send three warships, says Cromwell, into Chesapeake Bay and impose my will. Again, the House of Burgess's response, the letter also signed by the governor. Thank you for letting us know in advance of your intentions. <laughs> we have already raised the money to hire Dutch and French mercenary ships to meet you in Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> this is who we are, right? <laughs> Europeans continued on a different path. They continued to evolve. We are actually strikingly similar to where we were a couple hundred years ago, politically, not technologically, but politically. Europe goes through a lot more changes, right? And at the risk of the getting into a boring history lesson, what's in the shortest possible way what's going on in Europe is this. The political parties and the political institutions set up after World War II are dying. The welfare state simply cannot survive the transition of the baby boom into full retirement in Europe. And you know they're panicking because they're privatizing things. They're, even though they are still social democrats in the majority, most European countries have privatized and sold off their post offices, their telephone companies, which should usually be government owned, their airlines. Uh, you can, particularly this is true in Scandinavia, but you see it in Germany, uh, you see it in other parts of Europe as well. They're not privatizing because they woke up one day and all became followers of Milton Friedman. They're privatizing because they need the money. They've got to pay for the welfare state. And if selling off industries is the way to do it, that's what they're going to do. But it's just not enough, right? They need a new class of younger, working age taxpayers. And if you're on the center left or the far left, you also need a new class of voters because this is the other problem they're facing. From the left wing perspective, their working class voters starting in the 1970s have left them. 